So our spiritual theme for 2019 is spirituality in action. And we fix them to ramp it up, y'all. <laughs> because this month, our theme for the month is to promote diversity and inclusion. So we're going to tie that with Ernest Holmes' statement of what I believe is, I believe the ultimate goal of life to be the complete emancipation from all discord of every nature and that this goal is sure to be attained by all. Which kind of amuses me now when I did this last year, and now I look at it and I go, what could create more discord than talking about diversity and inclusion, right? <laughs> What's up with that? Um, and talking about it is how we're going to get through it, and no growth happens in the comfort zone. So, this month, today's topic is diversity is the magnificence of creation. Next week, unique but different. Easter Sunday, leaving the tomb. And then the final Sunday of this month, inclusion beyond otherness. And afterwards, we will have a workshop if you care to avail yourself of that. It really brings a whole month into it and explores how do we actually put this stuff into practice day to day. <coughs> that said, let's talk about diversity as the magnificence of creation. I did some research and I just get more and more amused at us human folks. Because, I don't know about y'all, but I grew up with that phrase, get a backbone. Right? And then I do a little bit of research and I find out that 90% of all life on earth has no backbone. 90% is invertebrate. That blows my mind. We, we're only, like backbone things are only 10%, but we think we need to, everybody needs to have one. Which is kind of exactly what we do in dominant cultures, is it not? And yet, how many of us knew that literally 90% of life is invertebrate form? I didn't. Out of those two categories, 60,000 identified vertebrates. Currently, 1.2 million invertebrate species have been identified. They're still finding more, and they estimate that there's probably about 30 million. Now that's a lot that we have yet to discover. <clears throat> Somebody posted on Facebook this morning that we just, dictionary.com just added 300 definitions. Yeah, because diversity is happening. Now, the exciting part to me is that on some level we're actually waking up to include that diversity, to recognize it, to embrace it. They finally changed the definition of husband and wife. Because up until very recently, you could look up husband and wife in the dictionary, and it was all heterosexual binary references. And it doesn't have that anymore. So we've actually managed to loop into our mm. dictionary definition all wives and all husbands. It's just every time I hear a man say my husband or a woman say my wife, my heart giggles. <laughs> I just think that's fabulous. Because what it says is that we're recognizing and growing into an appreciation of what has always been. See, the words didn't create the newness. The words are recognizing what has always been. I did a little more research about 
ethnic cultures and diversity. And this one is somewhat shocking, but yet on some level not. There's a small little country called Burma, which is now Myanmar. Within that country, they recognize 135 different ethnic cultures within their small country. Ethnic group being defined as a community or population made up of people who share a common cultural background or descent. America, United States of America, is 85% larger than Myanmar, and we recognize six. I can't make this stuff up. <laughs> we recognize six ethnic cultures and ethnic groups in the United States of America. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's indicative of something. Could it be that we have a dominant mentality? I love your song, Jeff, because it's it calls it out. It's like we have got to wake up to what's right in front of us. I invite you to just take a minute and look around this room. And how many, just a quick count, how many different forms of diversity do you see in this room? Because if you count at all, it would at least equal the number of bodies in the room. <laughs> at minimum. Now, if you bring it into each of those bodies, that number begins to expand exponentially. Because Diversity really is the magnificence of creation. There are no two things alike. There are no two people alike. There are no two blades of grass alike. No two hairs on your head, some of us have more than others, <laughs> is alike. And yet, we have this tendency to want us to be alike. Part of my job as a minister is to periodically kick the hornet's nest, if you will. To rattle us out of our comfort zone. If you have not taken the opportunity to avail yourself of the book we're using this month, Stained Glass Spirit by Tracy Brown, I have never encountered a book that I could recommend more. It is clear, it is blunt, it is accessible, and it is honest. And it is a solution. It is about building a stained glass spiritual community where every part is recognized and enveloped in the whole and cherished and learned from. Tracy Brown happens to be a personal friend. She happens to be a practitioner in our movement. She happens to have won the Ernest Holmes Award in our movement. And she happens to be the chairperson of our Centers for Spiritual Living Leadership Council at the organizational level. Um, and I can honestly tell you that none of those things impact my recommendation of her book. <laughs> what impacts my recommendation of her book is her clarity. Here's an excerpt. And this is where I invite you to take another breath with me and to suspend any judgments that might come up for you. She's writing about 10 years ago when she's talking to ministers in our movement about diversity and inclusion. And these are just a few of the responses that she got. <clears throat> we are both one with God, so we are both the same. We are all one, so I don't need to pay attention to diversity. 
I don't care about diversity. What I care about is our sameness. We are all expressions of spirit. Diversity focuses on our differences, which is uncomfortable. So we focus instead on the things we agree about. Here's what Ernest Holmes said. While all people have the same origin, no two are alike, except in ultimate essence. So those of us that fall back on that word, the same, we don't want to look at this because it makes us uncomfortable. One, I appreciate their honesty. And it's time to move out of that. It's time to move beyond that. It is time to not just accept not just tolerate, but to authentically celebrate the magnificent diversity of creation. I mean, I'm looking around this room, I don't see any two haircuts the same. I don't see any two outfits the same. I don't see any two facial expressions the same. I see people who are categorized as Caucasian. I see people who are categorized as mixed race. I see people who I know are Jewish. I see people who I know are in recovery. I see people who I know are lesbians. I see people who I know are married, who are single, who are retired, who still work. Good heavens. What? The whole idea of sameness just makes me want to shove my head under water and stay there. Because, <laughs> really? I had a conversation a couple weekends ago. And it was one of those that started out with, what do they want from us anyway? <laughs> I'm like, Who's they? <laughs> well, they, in this conversation, were, were non-white people. Any non-white people. And what the conversation was really headed down the road of, what do non-white people want from white people? And the first thing I said to this person was, I can't speak for them. But I can tell you what I want from you. <laughs> I want you to stop living in us and them. Let's start there. And she went on to articulate, and, I, and I, there's, a, there's a part of me that really loves it when people do this because it gives me a beautiful opportunity to tell me how many black friends she had growing up. Here will always be my response, just so you know. How many white friends did you have? Uh, that was the response. No, really, how many white friends did you have? I don't know, why would I know that? I'm like, I don't know, why would you know you had three black ones? I ain't judging, yeah I am. Yeah, totally judging. And here's the thing. Why are we counting the black friends and we're not counting the white friends? Why can you tell me how many lesbian friends you have and you can't tell me how many heterosexual friends you have? Why can you tell me how many Jewish friends you have but you can't tell me how many Christian friends you have? I can tell you why. Because we've all been anesthetized by the concept that a dominant culture really is important. And the only reason a dominant culture has power, folks, is because we give it to it. And when we take our power back, a dominant culture will no longer have its power. That is what happens when we individually start celebrating the magnificence of creation as diversity. I'll go out on a limb and say, not one of you has a closet full of exactly the same outfit that you wear every day. Every day. <laughs> I don't even know why this is coming up, but I'm going to go with it. 
One of the phrases that folks that look like me oftentimes say that is incredibly hurtful, it's not intended to be, but it is, is when we're engaged in those conversations about human diversity, and we're particularly focused on skin color, and we utter the words, I don't see color. Mm -hmm. Think about that for just a minute. What you just said to a person of color is, I don't see you. You don't matter enough to me to even notice. And yet, if that person were to look at you and say, close your eyes, don't look at anything, what color shirt do you have on? You'd be able to tell them. So the statement, I don't see color, isn't even true. <laughs> it's not true. Are we willing to navigate our discomfort long enough to find a place of celebration? Are we willing to start wherever we are? Because folks, this is not about guilt, shame, and blame. This is about healing. This is about healing. You can't possibly know what needs to be healed until you identify it. Okay? If you go to the barber shop expecting to buy a loaf of bread, you're going to be disappointed. If you go to Safeway to get a haircut, everybody's confused. <laughs> we have to identify what needs to be healed in order to be in the healing process. And so I invite you over the next week. Start by identifying all of the areas of diversity that live in you. Start at home. Start at home. And, and if you're struggling with that, start with what you can see. You have two hands. They're not the same. Look at your fingernails. They're not the same. Your arms. Your first, it's your second amendment guarantee you have the right to be armed. <laughs> <laughs> They're not the same. They turn different directions. You cannot take them off and interchange them. They're different for a reason. There's a tremendous amount of diversity within your own body. Start there. Start out in nature. Really look. Look at each leaf on the same tree and see the magnificence of diversity. Stare at a one-inch patch of grass and really take it in. And then extrapolate that out. Go to a parking lot and just sit and watch and observe and notice and celebrate how many different shapes and sizes and heights and wardrobes and hairstyles and colors go by you. That is really the beginning. And then step out of your comfort zone and begin a conversation with somebody that you don't necessarily know. Maybe somebody that you know about, but you don't really know them. Maybe somebody who you have been thinking you know, but then you realize, yeah, I never even really asked them who they are or where they came from or what they like. Ask. Be curious. Delve into the safe zone of diversity. Build the muscle to start with. Build the muscle. But we've got to start somewhere. We say every Sunday that we're a radically inclusive community. Are we? Are we? 
I can give you several evidences that say we are here, but we're not actually. Now, the beautiful part is that we have the intention to be that. And there are places on the planet that have the intention to be the antithesis of that. We're at least ahead of the game. Every time something shifts in this community and some part of you goes, that is not how we do it. <laughs> that is evidence that, oh, we are not a radically inclusive community. <laughs> because a radically inclusive community cannot have a static identity. Think about that. We cannot have a static identity and be radically inclusive because the minute we have a static identity, folks, there's no room for any newness. Now, I'm going to close with this for your consideration. You picked me. <laughs> you picked me. And I'm not going anywhere. And I am radically inclusive. Which means we are going to become our vision. We are going to step into it. And we are going to change. And we are going to grow. And we are going to be curious in our own community and in the greater community. Because unity and oneness is difference embraced. It is diversity celebrated. And what I know in my heart that moves me every time I think about being your minister is that this community has a capacity to step into that. I don't have to build your awareness of your capacity. I just have to tap into it and together we teach each other how to do it. We're going to make mistakes. We are. We're going to step in it. And it's going to be ugly. And it's going to be uncomfortable. So what? No innovation ever happened outside of conflict. All of us enjoyed a lot of modern things. Every one of those came out of conflict. Every one of them. So how about we begin to celebrate the conflict? How about we develop the courage to navigate our own discomfort, own it, practice active compassion with one another like we say we do? Let's walk our talk. And as we do that, this whole move to a new building will happen automatically because it will have to, because there will be no room in here for the magnificence of diversity that we will call in and create. Let's take this into prayer. <clears throat> what I know in every fiber of my being is that that which creates must be diverse must be. That singular source that creates out of imagining the possibilities of itself. What an imagination it has. What a desire it has to know itself, to be itself, to experience itself in magnificent multiplicity of form of experience, of emotion, of culture, of music, of art, of nature. How good it is to know that I am that in form. That every form, every, every expression of diversity is created in its image. So it must be absolute diversity. 
knowing that all life is diverse, knowing that we are each created out of it, by it, to be it. I speak my word, affirming, claiming, demanding that we step into a greater level of responsibility for who we be and we be about the business of celebrating diversity, of celebrating all of creation, not just the ones we like. <clears throat> That we celebrate the colors that, that we celebrate Brussels sprouts when they don't want to go in our mouths. <laughs> that we celebrate every expression of creation, knowing we are always a choice. That we cease to vilify and instead lift one another up. That we cease to write a script about who somebody else is. And we step into the infallible courage of our being to ask, to inquire, to connect with that other aspect of ourselves. So grateful to know that every place I look, I see me. And that everyone who looks at me sees themselves. All creation in form. Beautifully diverse. And so in this gratitude, I release my word into that activity of love and law that only knows itself can never say no to itself and has already said yes before the words were even spoken. It is done. And I invite you, if you are ready to step into a greater experience of you, that you join me in owning this as your own by saying with me, and so it is. Celebrate. 
So you're telling Stephen to bring in friends, absolutely, young, young people, youngins. 